Good evening and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, July the 21st, 2024. This is the lesson that will be presented when we gather together here in Bellflower at the Rose Avenue Church of Christ at 6 o'clock in the evening. And as is always the case if you are in our area, we do invite you to come and be with us as we gather together to worship God. Each Sunday we have a Bible study at 945 in the morning. We have a morning worship service at 1050, another worship service at 6 o'clock, and then a Bible study on Wednesday night at 730. And you are certainly welcome at any and every one of the times that we gather together to worship God. If you are in our area, we would be honored to have you as our guest. And it is our hope that our time spent together will bring glory to God and that his word will prevail and that it will give us the strength that we need as we strive to live our lives according to his will. Let's go ahead and get to the lesson that we have prepared here for this evening. Today we are continuing our study, our journey through the Bible, which is a study of the 17 time periods of Bible history. This is actually a study that we began about two and a half years ago, uh, one Sunday night a month. Typically it's the second Sunday, but because I was out of town the first Sunday, I've moved both last week's lesson and this one back a week. But nevertheless, it is my hope that we find benefit in these studies. Of course, we are in the midst of dealing with Israel um, in the wilderness. And of course, that is the um, sixth period of Bible history. You have uh, the events prior to the flood, and then you have the flood and the events uh, following that. The third uh, uh, his time of history is the scattering of the nations. That is followed by the patriarchal age. And then we have Israel in Egypt and the Exodus as they take place, bringing us to Mount Sinai. And of course, that brings us to the sixth period of time, which is the wanderings in the wilderness. And I have classified from leaving Egypt till they uh, arrive in the promised land as this particular time period. We've actually devoted the last seven or the last five lessons to Israel at Mount Sinai. And we've noted a lot of things there, and we could actually devote a considerably larger amount of time to their time at Mount Sinai because that becomes the foundation of the rest of the Old Testament, uh, the foundation of God's ultimate plan of salvation to bring a people into, uh, to, to establish a people who would bring his Messiah into the world ultimately. And so it's worthy of giving consideration to some of the things that are taught there. And we could have devoted more time to that. But it's time to leave Mount Sinai. And that's what we want to begin with in our lesson today. And I actually intend to devote two lessons to this particular study here, leaving Mount Sinai. And we're going to begin our study in Numbers chapter 10 today. And notice a handful of events from the time that they leave Mount Sinai till the time that they begin their, four, their 38 years of wandering following the two years that it has taken them to get to uh, the edge of the promised land. So let's go ahead and get started. And we find in Numbers chapter 10 and in verse number 11, it tells us there in that particular text, it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony and the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journey. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So here we find it's been approximately a year since they arrived at Mount Sinai. Uh, we're actually told in Exodus chapter 19 that it was in the third month that they arrived. We know that a lot has happened while they are at Mount Sinai. Their, their, their religion is now established, and it's time for them to move on. And the intent of the Lord was for them to arrive at the land of Canaan, and he would give them the promised land. But some things take place that sets that back for a little while. Now what's interesting, as you continue to read in Numbers chapter 10, we have, we have some uh, instructions about their leaving. We have the order is set into place in which they travel. And I'm just going to briefly mention these things here, as well as the leaders who are appointed. We find the order in which the tribes set out. 
you have the first three tribes. Judah is first, followed by Issachar, then Zebulun. And then after that, you have the temple is uh, disassembled and carried by various Levites. Following this, you have the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And then you have uh, the, the, the Korathites and others carrying the holy furnishings um, that were to be put into the tabernacle. And if you wonder why there was a, um, a division between the tabernacle and the things, what it says in the text is the tabernacle went ahead because they would disassemble that. And when they arrived at where they were going to camp, they would set up the tabernacle. And then when the holy, the, the holy furnishings arrived, they could be placed into the tabernacle. And following the holy furnishings, you have the last six tribes, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And thus you would have the order of this incredible group of people wandering through the wilderness. A number of people that, that um, exceeded more than a million when you find out that there were 600,000 men who were numbered, who would have been uh, uh, able to be soldiers and so on. So you have a massive group of people who are traveling across the wilderness, and God is taking care of them. And then we find that as they are traveling, one of the things that happens in verses 29 and following is Moses asks his father-in-law, Hobab, to go with them. And his father-in-laws were ready to return to his home, but Moses pleads with him for his wisdom to go along with them. And uh, we're not told for sure whether he decided to follow along, but there are some indications that maybe he decided to stay with, the, with uh, Israel as they wandered throughout the wilderness. And then we have in verses 33 through 36, that we're told that they traveled for three days and uh, then they rest in this wilderness of Paran. Now it's interesting, I want you to note in verse 34 uh, what is stated in chapter 10 where it says, The cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. So you find these prayers of Moses as the Ark of the Covenant is lifted and as it is brought to rest in the tabernacle when they traveled from place to place. Well, that brings us to chapter 11, where we find once again Israel is ungrateful and they are complaining. And what we have taking place here in chapter 11 is they're complaining because they don't have meat. They're complaining about the, uh, uh, the fact that they have to, all, all they have is this loathsome, loathsome manna that God has provided for him. And the way they complain, they recall the fish and the vegetables that they had to eat in Egypt, as if things were so great for them when they were there in slavery. And of course, we find that once again, the Lord is angered with them. And you read in the first couple of verses of chapter 11 that a fire breaks out on the outskirts of the camp, uh, consumes some of the people on the outskirts, and immediately the people uh, uh, cry out to Moses, is to deliver them. Moses prays to the Lord and the fire is stopped. But you find that they are continuing to complain about not having food. And as a result of this, we find that the Lord is very angry with the people on this particular occasion here. And Moses is actually frustrated as they are complaining to him. I want you to notice in chapter 11, and beginning in verse number 11, what Moses says in complaining to the Lord. You read here, Moses says, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? And you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to, your fa to their fathers? Well, what's interesting here is Moses as he's frustrated, he says that these are your people, Yahweh. These are your people. 
I didn't ask to lead them. And here they are complaining. He goes on in verse number 13. Where, where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight. And do not let me see my wretchedness. So he's pleading with Yahweh for help in dealing with these people. And Yahweh responds to the request of Moses on this particular occasion. As a matter of fact, he says he's going to be feeding the people. And he says, I'm going to give them food not for one day. I'm going to give them meat not for two days, not for a week. I'm going to give them meat for 30 days. And I'm going to give them so much meat that it's going to be coming out of their nostrils. They're going to find it loathsome. And, of course, Moses makes the observation in verse 21. You know, there's 600,000 men on foot here, plus their families. How, how, how are you going to give this group of people meat? And I want you to note the Lord's response in verse 23 of chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So the Lord is saying, do you think I can't accomplish what needs to take place? And of course, we're going to find in a few moments that he does provide meat for them on this occasion. But he also relieves the other, correct, the other request that Moses has. He's frustrated because the burden of the people is so heavy on him. And the Lord says, choose 70 elders of the people and I will fill them with the Holy Spirit that you have I will fill them with the spirit that you have and they will be able to help you in making judgments and helping with the people and Moses selects these 70 elders and as the Lord promised they are filled with the spirit that he had and as a result of that Moses receives some help but there's also another interesting event that actually takes place while this is while this is happening with the Lord. You read there in about verse number 26 that uh, 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 there were two, uh, verse 25, that there were two men in the camp who also prophesied as the Lord put his spirit upon them. And they were not among this particular number. And of course, when it is reported to Moses that these two individuals are prophesying, Joshua pleads with Moses to make them stop. This is not what was intended to take place. And it's interesting what Moses says to Joshua on this particular occasion here. We find uh, in chapter 11, Numbers chapter 11, let me get back to Numbers chapter 11, we find in, verses, in, in verse number 29, the way that Moses responds, I'm in the wrong chapter, excuse me, you read here, Moses says to Joshua, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp. And the point that is made in that text there is, uh, you know, Moses said, I wish all the people prophesied. Maybe they would... Maybe they would be more faithful to God if they were all like that. And, and the other point is, oh, that all the people were actually faithful to God in the things that they were doing. And then, of course, you read after this that Yahweh sends quail in great abundance. And it basically says he sent so much that each one, that the least of them gathered at least ten homers. And if I understand, uh, <coughs> a homer was actually somewhere around 50, a 55-gallon drum. And so they were gathering so much, so much quail that they couldn't even put it everywhere. And they were stacking it in various places. And then it says that they were giving into their intense cravings. And while the meat was, um, was in their teeth, it almost seems to indicate they didn't even wait to prepare it properly. And there was no demonstration of gratitude to God for this. But it says that the anger of the Lord was against them, and he struck them with a plague. And more than likely, as a result of this, many died because of this particular plague and because of their ingratitude. And then following this, we find that the people moved out. 
from where they were at. So they may continue to move forward on their journeys in the wilderness. Now when we come to chapter 12, we find that Aaron and Miriam, and you remember Aaron is Moses' brother, Miriam is his sister, they complain to Moses, they challenge him. And the text says in the first verse here that they spoke against him because of um, he had married an Ethiopian woman and whatever was involved in that. But it also says in verse number two, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So here they're challenging him because they are not being respected. They're challenging his authority. And then beginning in verse number three, Yahweh calls them out. He says to three of them, you all come here in front of me, in front of the tabernacle. And I want you to notice in verse number six. And incidentally, you read in verse number three here after they were critical. It says in verse three, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all who... Uh, all men who were on the face of the earth, at least at that time. His humility was greater than all others. And this is the challenge of the Lord in verse 6. He said to Aaron and Miriam, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make, known, my, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Yet not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And it says, the anger of the Lord aroused against them and he departed. And as he departed and as the cloud departed, Miriam was leprous. And as a result of that, both Aaron and Moses immediately panicked. Aaron was fearful and he repented to the Lord for his sins and so on. And he pleads with Moses and Moses pleads with the Lord to remove the leprosy from Miriam. And the Lord responds to Moses that he will remove the leprosy. He said, but he, but he makes the observation, if a father spits on his daughter's faith, and, and this had to do with rebuking her because of disrespect or something like that. Basically that she would be rebuked for seven days or she'd be unclean for seven days. And the Lord said, let her, stay, let her basically stay outside the camp for seven days and then we will move on. And her leprosy was cleansed and the people of Israel waited for the seven days while she remained outside of the camp. And then Israel moves on and they move on to the wilderness of Paran. And that brings us to chapter 13, where we find that the 12 spies are being sent. And instructions are given that they were to go into the land of Canaan. And you read here in verse number 1 that the Lord told them to send 12 men to spy out the land. Uh, one man from each tribe. And the, 12, the, the, the various individuals are mentioned by name. And we find that they were to go throughout the land and they're given instructions and we're told in the text the various places that they went to spy out. They brought back some of the fruit of the land and they find that it was everything that the Lord had said. So they're gone for 40 days spying out the land. And, and incidentally, when you get to Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, it actually makes the point that this was a request of the people that before they go they wanted to spy out the land. And I want you to keep that in mind as we see the way that they behaved because they went and spied out the land. You know, the Lord was going to give them instructions. You just follow me. I'll take you in and it's going to be okay. Well, let's see what we're dealing with. So they send the spies. And then they come back and they give this report in verses 26 through 29. And it makes the point that one of the places they went, that they found a cluster of grapes that they carried on a... They, they carried on a branch with two different men carrying it. And the point is, is that's how abundant the grapes were. And they also brought back figs and pomegranates and other things like that. And they made the report that the land, uh, they basically said the land is everything that God said it would be. It's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. There's lots of abundance there. But, and anytime you hear that word, you know you got a problem. But, 
the cities are fortified, and the people are giants. This is a dangerous place. They swallow their inhabitants. And basically what they're beginning to say is, how in the world are we going to beat this? Now I want you to notice in verse number 13, or verse number 30, after they make this report, it says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Yes, it's everything that you said. The cities are walled and fortified, and the people are numerous, and, and, and they're big people. Let's go. Let's go and conquer the people. But then you read that the ten spies in verses 31 through 33 gave a bad report. Say, we're not able to go up. They're stronger than we are. And they said, the land through which we have gone um, as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are of, of great men. Um, and we saw the giants there. And in verse 33, he says, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So, that we, so we were in their sight. And the idea that, you know, uh, it, we were like small insects in their presence. They're so big. And so they basically gave this negative report that there's no way we're going to win this. And of course, typical of Israel, the people listen to the ten spies and they complain against Moses beginning in verse number uh, uh, verse number one of chapter 14. It says that they wept all night as they cried with their voices and they complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And then in verse number uh, 4, they said, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. They are so upset at the way at this report that these ten spies have given them, that they say, you know what, let's just go back to Egypt and submit and become their slaves again. How tragic a people have to be after everything that they have gone through. Now it's been difficult. Their time in the wilderness was not easy. But they wanted to go back into the slavery. And so the people are angry. And you find that in verse number 5, that Joshua and Caleb, they plead with the people. Uh, verse, verse, verse 5 says, Moses and Aaron fell on their face before the assembly. And in verse number 6, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthunah, who were among them uh, of the spies, they tore their clothes and spoke to the congregation of the children of Jesus, saying, The land we pass through... To spy out is exceedingly good, a good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And in verse number 10, it says that the people refused, and they took up stones. They wanted to stone Moses and Aaron, and probably Joshua and Caleb because of the things that they were saying. And of course, the Lord appears. The glory of Yahweh appears in the latter part of verse number 10. And once again, he speaks to Moses, and he basically tells Moses, how long are these people going to reject me? He says, get out of the way. Basically says, I'll strike them down and I'll start over with you. And of course, what we find in this text is Moses once again pleading with God on behalf of these people. He intercedes on their behalf and he, and he reminds the Lord, and you might understand, the Lord knows these things, but he reminds them nevertheless. And it's interesting because in verse 17 you read, Now I pray that the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying the Lord is long-suffering, abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children to the third and fourth generation. 
Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Now, one interesting observation here is back in Exodus 34, and this is when Moses is about to go up to Mount Sinai the second time. Remember, he broke the tablet because of the tablets because of their rebellion, because of the golden calf. And Moses goes up on the mountain a second time, and the words that he utters are the very words that Moses reminds the Lord of on this particular text, making the point that you are abundant in mercy and long-suffering, and you forgive iniquities and transgressions. Moses is saying, don't wipe them out. And he says, if you do, think about what the nations around are going to say. He brought him into Israel, and he couldn't bring him to the land he promised. And we find that the Lord tells Moses that I have pardoned the people. He listens to Moses, and he pardons the people. But he basically says they're going to be punished. And it is in this text where you read that it says that all who were over 20 years of age would perish in the wilderness. And furthermore, you find that they were going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation had died off. Now, it's going to be 38 more years because it's taken them two years to get to this particular point. And then the statement is made, those little ones who you said would be victims, they're going to be the ones that are going to inherit the land. But you also find in the midst of the condemnation of the Lord that he exempts Joshua and Caleb of this. In verse 30 of chapter 14, you read, Everyone from 20 old and above is going to be consumed, except for, jo for Caleb the son of Jephthuna, and Joshua the son of Nun. You shall, by no means, uh, uh, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. So only Joshua and Caleb are exempted. And that will factor in when we get into the book of Joshua as they conquer the land. And of course, after this declaration, you find the people regret their rebellion as they typically did when they find out they're in trouble because they've angered the Lord. They regret their rebellion. And it says they attempt to go into the land and to drive the people out. Said, we're going to go up there and go. And Moses tells them in verse 41, why? Why, why are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord? You're not going to succeed. He's not with you. Yahweh is not with you. But they attempt an invasion anyways, and the people are defeated as a result of that. And the wording that is used there seems to indicate that it was a great defeat that was levied against them on this particular occasion here. And thus, they're instructed to go into the wilderness. And for the next 38 years... They're going to be wandering in the wilderness, going from place to place. And we're not given a whole lot of detail of what happens during this time period. Deuteronomy 2 is going to record the various places they went, and the indication seems to be at least once a year. I don't know how much more, but at least once a year they would travel. Uh, the tent would be taken up, and the, they'd be forced to move from one location to another, just wandering around in the wilderness until all the generation that had rebelled against God died, those who were over 20 years of age, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Now, it's interesting because in the book of Numbers, there's a couple of chapters that give some more instructions associated with the Levites and with the land. For example, in chapter 15, you read about uh, instructions about some of the offerings that they are to make to the Lord. You also find instructions about intentional and unintentional sins. And, and I want us to notice verse 30. Numbers 15 and verse number 30. After talking about unintentional sins and the sacrifices that they need to do to make atonement for those, read in verse 30, it says, But the person who does anything presumptuously whether he is native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off, his guilt shall be upon him. 
And what I want you to understand here is when you deliberately and intentionally sin against God, there is a problem. Now, I do believe under our law that the mercy of God provides that we can be forgiven even from intentional sins. But understand the difference between something that you do deliberately and something that just unintentionally you do. And if we're followers of God, we ought not to be deliberately and intentionally rebelling against him. And there's the warning of that passage. They were completely dependent upon the mercy and grace of God when they did intentional acts against him. Then we have a, another sad event in verse 32 of chapter 15 where you have as they're wandering, and we don't know when this has taken place, but they're resting on the Sabbath somewhere. There's, an, there's a man who goes out and he just gathers sticks. And they find him gathering sticks and they put him into custody and they inquire of the Lord, what do we need to do about this? And the Lord said, you take him out and stone him to death. And his sin will be upon himself as a result of that. And that's exactly what the congregation did. And the point of this, God is serious. God is serious about what he says. And then that brings us to chapter 16 and 17. And this is where we read about Korah and about 250 other leaders of the men who stage a rebellion against Moses and against Aaron. And they basically, they basically want to overthrow Moses and they want to lead the people. And you find, you find here that there's this challenge that takes place that Moses says, let's find out who God's going to accept. And he takes, he takes the rod of Aaron and he takes the rods from these other individuals. And in chapter 17, it reads that God bud, uh, caused the rod of Aaron to bud, but the others didn't. And then you read that these Korah and those who are following him are punished by God and the ground opens up and swallows them up alive because of their rebellion against God. Now I'm going to I want to stop right here and I'm going to deal a little more with that next week or in my next lesson in this particular study next month. Uh, but the observation I want to make here is as I just mentioned a few moments ago, they're dwelling in Israel for 38 years and we are not told a whole lot of what happens during that 38 that year 38 period of years. Whether the events of Korah and those with him happened immediately after they were rejected. And I kind of lean toward that. But yet there are others who say that possibly this actually happened a little later on. Maybe even as they were concluding their 38 years. Something to that effect. And the, and the point is, is we're not specifically told exactly when these events happened. But there's, um, there's the events while they're wandering in the wilderness, or at least the first part of that. As we wrap up this lesson, let's just take a couple of moments, as we've been doing with every one of these lessons, and let's notice a few applications that we can make for ourselves. And there are a lot of applications that we could make from this particular text. The first one that I want to observe is the fact that we need to move forward. You know, uh, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 1, it says, leaving the discussion of elementary principles, let us go on to perfection. You know, when, uh, when you look at Scripture, you find that God expects us to be constantly moving forward. We need to be maturing in the faith. We need to be building upon our faith and growing in maturity as Christians as time goes on. Well here the children of Israel have been at Mount Sinai now for about a year and they've accomplished the things that God said but they haven't inherited the land yet. So he says it's time to move forward and that's exactly what they started to do and that's the lesson that we need to learn from that. Another lesson we need to learn is that of contentment. And I remind you again of the rebellion and the ingratitude of the people as they are in the wilderness. And how they're complaining to, to Moses because they want, they want meat. We miss the meat that we had. We miss the fish that we had in Egypt. And, and, and all those vegetables. And, and, and basically as they, as they talk about the, the manna that they're eating, it's, it's almost like they're complaining 
about this. We're tired of this manna. We've done everything that we can. We've tried to cook it in every conceivable way that we can. We're tired of eating manna. We want meat. It's a lack of contentment. And, and, and I know we've talked about this in dealing with manna before, but just think about how God had blessed them and how God had sustained them. And this manna, they got up in the morning and the food was there. It was there for them to gather. And their lives were protected and sustained by God miraculously in the midst of a harsh wilderness. But they're not satisfied. Over in 1 Timothy 6, and in verse number 6, Paul tells Timothy, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, as he makes the point there. For we bought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And with food and clothing, with these we shall be content. We need to learn to be satisfied with what we have, whatever that is. Remember how Paul in Philippians 4, grateful that the brethren at Philippi were helping him more than once, but he says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Whether I'm hungry or full, whether I'm clothed or not, no matter what, I've learned to be content where I'm at. And we need to learn contentment. And, and, and if we want to live our lives with the hope of heaven when this life is over, we need to not make this world our goal. And if this world is not going to be our ultimate goal, then we need to be content and learn to be content with whatever it is that we have, no matter how much or how little that might be. Another lesson that we learn from the text that we've looked at is our need to bear one another's burdens. Remember how as the people were complaining to Moses? He's frustrated. And bear in mind, he's only two years in at this point. Two years in, and the people are complaining about, uh, about wanting meat and so on. And, and Moses goes to the Lord, and you can read of his frustration as he's pleading with the Lord. And he says, it's too much for me. I need help. And of course, God provided help for him. And, and that reminds me of how when we've got a brother who is in need, if we're able to, to the best of our ability, we need to help that brother whatever it is in Galatians chapter 6 and and in verse number 1 you read there if a brother is overtaken in a trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted and then in verse 2 he says bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ God expects us as his family to be there for one another. We need to, as Paul told the Thessalonians, to, uh, to uh, as he said there in 1 Thessalonians 5 and in verse number 14, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. We need to be there for one another, and we need to be bearing one another's burdens. Moses needed help, and the Lord provided the help that he needed on that particular occasion. Another lesson that we can learn from the text that we've looked at is we need to take confidence that God can accomplish His will. And I remind you that as, as the Lord says, I'll provide meat for them. Moses said, how are you going to provide meat for um, a million people in the middle of the wilderness? And this is where the Lord says to his you know, said to him, as we pointed out, is my hand too short that it cannot accomplish my will? We need to understand that God can accomplish that which he desires. Whatever his will is, he can accomplish that. Over in Isaiah chapter 29, and in verse number 16, you read in that particular text there. It says, surely uh, you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say to him who made it, How did he make me? Or shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, He has no understanding? And you have the same type of an idea over there in Romans chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. The, 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 the clay does not say to the potter, Why did you make me this way? 
We need to learn to trust God and know that God is able to accomplish whatever he needs to accomplish. And we need to be careful before we question what he is able to do. Another lesson that we need to consider is uh, what is our desire where God's people are concerned? Remember how when God helped Moses by giving him the 70 people, you also read that in the camp, there were two others who were not among that number, among whom the Holy Spirit or the Spirit also came upon them, and they too were able to prophesy. And, and uh, uh, Joshua asks Moses to stop them, but Moses says, no, I'm not going to stop them. I wish that everyone, I wish that everyone prophesied like these people. And that just reminds me, oh, what, is, what is our attitude toward our brethren? What is our desire concerning them from a faithful standpoint? Is it, is it our desire that God's people be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, 2 Peter 3.18? It, 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 is it our desire that they excel and that they thrive in their faith? Is it, is it our desire that everyone be right with God. You know, I'm reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where Paul is describing love and he makes the point that the love that we are to have, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. That's the love that we need. We, we, we need to believe in our brethren and, we, and we, need to, we need to hope that what is best is what will be accomplished where they are concerned. Another lesson that we learned from this is what I would describe as the grasshopper complex. Remember how when the spies return and they're reporting the land and they talk about the cities are fortified, there's giants in their midst. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. If you've ever heard the expression, the grasshopper complex, it is based upon this particular passage of scripture here. And basically what it's saying is you look at a problem before you and rather than reasoning how can I deal with this problem, you talk yourself out of it. Talk yourself out of being able to. And there's two things that Israel did on this occasion. Number one, they exaggerated Canaan's condition. Yeah, the land was full of, it was fortified as well, but that just means it was prepared for them. But there's the realization if God is on our side, we should be okay. And that's the other point they made. They exaggerated how terrible Canaan was, but also they minimized their ability and the resources that they had to deal with the problem. And you know, how often is it that people today will not do something because they see the problem as too big and oftentimes they exaggerate the problem and make it bigger than it actually is. Or looking at it from the other side, or as looking at it from the other side, they, they say that I'm unable, I don't have the ability and I don't have the resources to deal with this. When in reality they're not looking for the resources. We need to make sure that we do not make our problems bigger than they really are. You know, sometimes when you think about evangelism, this is one of those areas. Nobody wants to hear the truth. It's such a hard thing. Well, are you willing to work to overcome whatever those difficulties are? You know, I think of David and Goliath in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Here you have this little boy who has a sling and five stones. And he takes down the champion of the Philistines, a giant who is about nine feet tall. Why? Well, as David said, God's on my side. He said, yes, you're a problem, and you're a big problem, but my solution is greater than your problem. And that's what we need to realize. Don't make your problems bigger than they are, but also realize that God is greater than any problem you'll face in this world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, John said in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse number 4. So when we are facing giants, do not cower like a grasshopper and let that keep you from doing anything, but rather you press on and you press ahead and you try to accomplish what you need to do. Just think about this. Israel 
could have been in the promised land 38 years earlier had they just simply for once demonstrated the faith that God had given them plenty of reason to see and have. The grasshopper complex describes one whose faith is weak. And of course that's not pleasing to God as it wasn't pleasing to him back then. But another and final lesson that I want us to consider here is that, you know, sometimes we make decisions and others suffer the consequence because of our sins and our decisions. And the bottom line is we need to we need to think seriously before we act and realize that there are consequences to what we do. And very often what we do affects others. So, yes, the children of Israel, because of the rebellion of these people, they suffered the consequences of most of them dying in the wilderness. The children would watch their parents die in the wilderness, among other things. So don't let that happen to you. And thus, we can see Israel as they leave Mount Sinai and head toward the promised land. And when I see this idea, I might ask, where are you right now? You look at your life. Where are you now compared to where you need to be? And if you've been sitting still for a while, you need to resolve that you're going to move on and you're going to move out. Move toward the next destination. Moving toward the Jordan that you will ultimately cross. So think about that. And the lesson is yours. And if you would, please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we again come to you. And we do thank you for everything that you've done for us. <laughs> we, thank for, we thank you for giving us the example of your people. We thank you for your long-suffering and your grace and your willingness to forgive. Even in the midst of rebellion. If we will but turn back to you. Dear God, help us to learn from the examples of those of times past. Learn so that we will not repeat the things that they did that were contrary to your will, and so that we will do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Be with us as we go through this day, as we go through our lives, as we go through our wilderness wanderings, looking toward the promised land when this life is over. Help us to be faithful and help us to put our trust in you in everything that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. And again, and as always, thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope you find a little bit of benefit in the things that are said here as we continue our journey through the scriptures. And we can see that everything that is there is there for a reason, and there are lessons for us to learn. So keep that in mind as you go through this day, as you go through the rest of this week. And until next week, may God be with you. Thank you for listening and goodbye.